What a view, eh? Today's walk is going to take us back some 6,000 years in time. We're going to have a look at the Medway megaliths. Let's do it. The car is parked at the Bluebell Hill picnic site, which allows us to visit three and a half or four of the eastern Medway megaliths within an easy walk. Megalith is the Latin word for great big stone slab and it is what archaeologists use for those great big stone slabs that form part of an ancient monument. And that is what the Medway megaliths are. Ancient monuments, burial sites mostly, if not all of them, built about 4000 BC, a period we call the Early Neolithic or Stone Age. We find these monuments in groups, probably because they represent centres of ancient population. Here, they are located east and west of the River Medway, hence the name Medway Megaliths. In a past video we have looked at Bellas Knapp, a long barrow of the so-called Cotswold Severn group. The Medway Megaliths are the southeasternmost group in the UK and arguably impressive sites. No Stonehenge or Avebury, of course, but very imposing in their own way. The more you study them, the more fascinating they become. What a sight these mounds must have been in their original splendour. Sadly, a trait we share with our ancestors throughout the centuries is our propensity for vandalism. But more about that when we come to our first port of call. And here it is. Not me. Over there. Now isn't that an impressive sight? It's even got a beautiful iron fence around it, thoughtfully erected on the orders of General Pitt Rivers in 1885 to add a bit more majesty and serenity to the scene. But seriously, there was a lot of vandalism going on even back then, and the fence is probably a good idea. Kit's Cotty House are the remains of a chamber inside a large burial mound running from east to west, some 80 metres in length and 15 metres wide. The height of the chamber within was about 2 metres. Look how yesterday's act of vandalism can become today's interesting detail. There's a carving over there, I can't quite read the name, but the year is 1875. It must have been that kind of thing that made our friend Pitt install the fence. A Neolithic long barrow is, if left alone, an extremely sturdy thing. We've seen that in the case of Bella Snap, where the skeletons of our Neolithic ancestors have been lying undisturbed for a period which is three times as long as has passed since the murder of Julius Caesar. The combination of religious fanatism and general lack of education form a very powerful force. Unsurprisingly, they go hand in hand with each other and uh, together, more often than not, form one of the prime banes of humanity. In the 13th century, in an attempt to manifest Christian beliefs over the then still existing pagan rituals, many of the then known Neolithic burial sites were systematically destroyed. In the past, religion was the big problem for our megaliths. Today it is ploughing. Here we see an aerial picture from 1976 where the flattened mound was still visible. I shot another one today where not a trace remains. Let's have a look at Little Kit's Cotty just down the road and then over to the White Horse Stone and to our mystery of the day. Farmers, landowners, what would we do without them? I can tell you one thing. We would be walking from Kit's Cotty House to Little Kit's Cotty in about 10 minutes less time. Well, one thing is almost certain. We are going to have the site to ourselves 
for a few minutes. In getting here, I had to wade knee deep through the bones of other people who've tried along the uh, busy Rochester Road. That may have been a bit of an exaggeration, but the 100 metres or so you have to walk along busy Rochester Road with no pavement and cars coming at you with at least 60 miles per hour is really dangerous. But there were no bones to wade through, probably because they immediately get pulverised along with other mangled bits of unfortunate walkers by the following traffic. Let's not spend too much time at Little Kids Cotty. Today it is a jumble of toppled sarsens that most certainly was put into this state by some lovely people. In this case, in the late 17th century, according to some reports. It's nice enough even now, in winter, because it's so green. Everything is overgrown with ivy and there's almost a roof over us. Imagine what a perfect joy it must be to walk along here on a hot summer's day. In the days long before the M6 motorway, Scotland was many travel days away from the kingdoms of the south. And yet it appears that fighting between the Picts and the Britons was not unusual. In the year 449, Vortigern, then king of the Britons, was fed up with this and invited two Saxon warlords over to help him fight. They were the twin brothers Hengist and Horsa, and their names would live on to feature many English legends. They did help Vortigern with great success, but, in a manner not untypical for the great leaders of mankind, later fell out and started fighting against him. In 455, Horsa was killed in the Battle of Aylesford, just down the road from here, but Hengist lived on to become the first Anglo-Saxon Lord of Kent. The death of Horsa is the stuff of many legends, and somehow they often involve the Medway megaliths. Some say that Horsa is actually buried at the White Horse Stone, which is where we have now arrived. Now isn't that an impressive sight? It looks much smaller on the pictures I've found so far, but it is massive and much higher than wide. It is, in fact, standing upright. Now there's no doubt that this is man-made. Whether this too was once part of a burial mound we can no longer say, at least not without some massive digging around. There certainly are some great big stones lying around here, to our right, to my right, to the, the south, that way. Here's a story I heard only once from a colleague. No matter how much hunting around I did on the internet from east to west, no matter how many hours I spent in second-hand bookshops reading my way through the shelves of Neolithic material, I heard it only once. I'm sure he didn't make it up, he must have heard it from someone else who heard it from someone else the way these things go. The story is that in the Battle of Aylesford, when Horsa was slain, his friends wanted to get him out of the way probably uh, until all the clubbing and daggering and running through was done, and they put him on top of the White Horse Stone. When they later came and picked him up, his blood had formed the shape of one of those white horses we see here in the region. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's actually a lovely tale. And it makes you think, could it be true? Could it be that there was a carving of a white horse on top of the stone, which had worn away over time, after all the white horses come from the Iron Age, mostly. Um, and if that was only visible when Horsa's blood went into the crevices, could well be. If so, maybe we could find something by looking at those stones with uh, X-ray fluorescence. Now, apart from the fact that the very existence of Hengist and Horsa outside the land of legend is in serious doubt, there is one more obstacle. This is not the original White Horse stone. It inherited the name after its predecessor, which was just lying 
down there in the valley between what is now the railway track and the A229 was hacked to smithereens by the local farmer because it got in the way of ploughing. A tendency has entered the stage about 200 years ago, and I would call that cultural indifference. If an old monument stands in the way of profit, that old monument is in trouble. Bella Snap is a striking example, but Smithy's megalith, located somewhere in that field just behind our stone here, is an even more radical case. When workers of Warren's farm found a large stone slab getting into the way of ploughing this field in 1822, they called in the local antiquarians, Clement Smithy and Thomas Charles, to have a professional look. What those two gentlemen thought their role should be is anybody's guess, but what we know is that under their supervision the entire monument was destroyed and any human remains dispersed within a few days. According to literature, today, not even a trace of that impressive monument can be seen in the fields at its original location. But is that really so? This long barrow was in a better shape than the others until it came to its sticky end by the hands of Mr. Fowl, the then owner of Warren's farm. You see, over the millennia it had been covered with silt that had washed down from the hill above, hiding it from medieval Christians. If Fowl had found and destroyed the entrance portal and the easternmost part of the burial chamber, the rest might have been buried just deep enough not to bother him. Is it still there? And if so, perhaps it does leave a trace above ground. You know how vegetation is sensitive to variations in the soil below. If there are old foundations or stone structures buried a few feet underground, that changes the humidity in the soil above and makes grass or what wheat or whatever it is grow more or less dense or with a different colour. Thus we can still see the shape of roundhouses at Iron Age settlements, such as here in Cheltenham, close to the Devil's Chimney. It might come out in spring, or in summer, or in a particularly dry year. If only we could find an aerial view created when conditions were right. Here is where the 1950s Ordnance Survey puts it, with great care and after some discussion, I might add, now accessible via Kent County's heritage maps. Look how it is just the same distance from the railway tunnel portal as the railway is from the A229. Here is a drone shot I made just now. Nothing really. Here is a Google Maps screenshot from today. Freshly ploughed, unfortunately, not much use. Here is a summer view from Google Earth. Now, this doesn't exactly stand out like a sore thumb, so to speak. Definitely not as clear as those Iron Age roundhouses we looked at earlier. That can have many reasons. But the location is spot on. Imagine my excitement when I saw this. I think we've got something here. Whoever's ploughing that field today should take a break in that small region and let the people with ground penetrating radar and minimal invasive probes do their work. Very little serious field archaeology has been performed in this region since we've added that great technology to our toolbox. Forget hidden tunnels in the pyramids of Giza. There's some incredibly interesting stuff right here under our feet and from a much more distant past. Mm -hmm.